in a perfect situation, you have all the senses under control. You'd like to have the sight, you'd like to have sound, touch. So when you move and you do something, whether it's your head, your body, if we can have a realistic response to that in a world in the way that you, you would expect, uh, you would have the best experience. Now, so far in Rift, we're really taking care of only the head tracking, uh, which is, as you can look around, and rendering, which is a stereo um, 3D depth perception. And it's very important, but it gives you a lot, since visual is one of the strongest senses. Um, but, so that's the area which we'll talk about technically. And an important part is uh, performance. It gets to be very critical in when you're doing VR. And what you really have to think about is the motion to photons latency. Uh, that is, when you move your head and when the scene, actual pixel image on the screen change color, you want that amount of time to be as short as possible because if it's too long, uh, you will have swimmy displays and a lot of it parts come together to make it possible. You need to think about the sensors, you need to think about the rendering loop, you have to make it tighter, uh, and you also need to make sure the display that we have, uh, switching time is as good as possible. Talking about game design, there's, you're really in a different world. So, your goal is to make the experience as complete and continuous as possible. Anything which would take you out, such as black screen switching, um, artificial effects, should be avoided. So you don't want to break the gameplay. And there's a range of other items, such as you need to design uh, VR-friendly assets to scale. You need to think about how to present the information in a way which looks good in VR. And control the speed, storytelling, that area is really for us together and for you guys in particular to explore. So Nate will uh, do a big part of a talk on that subject and I'll uh, kind of start out by going over some of the technical details. So VR input. Uh, in our case, the main input that we have, uh, which wasn't there before, is the um, head tracking. And this is done by a sensor fusion algorithm combines the data out of the gyroscope, accelerometer, and magnetometer, and it tries to give you the orientation um, of uh, where you're looking at. Uh, this particular moment, we only have the gyro and accelerometer, and, but magnetometer is on the device. We expect to be releasing that probably a little while later. So what the orientation gives you is really um, a quaternion for the space. It could be, you can also convert it to a matrix or anything. And what you want to do with that data is at the least apply it to the view. Um, so when you would ch change orientation, you would need to reposition your camera to look in that direction. Uh, at the same time, you also want to do uh, at least a simple head model. And this is, has to do with the fact that when you tilt your head, there is certain displacement in the way your eyes are, which actually moves items in the world. So if you model that, you get a much more immersive experience and the world doesn't drag around with you as much. So another thing which as a game developer you have to do is obviously combine that input with what, what is already there, which is a controller, mouse, keyboard, and perhaps other devices. So um, one thing, new input that you do get out of this is role. So in a, real, in a normal game, like for a first person shooter for example, you normally have an ability to look right, right and left and up and down. This can be done with a mouse in a different way. So, but you know, in VR, you really get a third orientation, which is your role, where you tilt your head. And if you just forget to do that, you know, do it, you will not, it will not be immersive uh, experience. You actually will not feel good. So you definitely have to put that in. Uh, and our most simple recommendation is to always take the pitch up and down motion and right and left motion, uh, and that is roll from the uh, sensors. That way you are fully have the freedom and space and it doesn't do anything unusual. And in terms of your rotation, you can actually add those extra inputs. So you can take the gamepad and mouse and keyboard and introduce that, uh, add it to the rotation angle. And that will allow you to have a freedom where you can, for example, the controller mimics your body rotating around while your head is where you look. And then beyond that, and this is really the exciting area where we would get to much more complete immersion, is more advanced input. We are not there yet, but this is something which we are uh, seriously researching and also the community has a lot of interest in, and it's other items. So in particular, 
important is positional tracking. So what you get with a with a gyroscope and current sensor fusion is an ability to look in any direction. But however, if you move left and right, or even forward and back, or lean down, that um, inf extra information is not reflected, which means that you sometimes you can feel the world view is dragged with you. Now, it's not a problem for some sets of games, uh, but it's something that if you actually improve it, the experience will be that much better. So. This is one area which we need to work on. Um, and then there's other exciting areas. So for example, controller tracking, when you have devices uh, such as uh, you know, Kinect and Razer Hydra, Hydra, which lets you have position in space, so you could perhaps aim in a certain rotation and look, and that would be rendered in your game. You would like to see your hand tracking where you can actually feel a part of it, which could be done with technology similar to or with leap motion. Um, so those are the areas which require both research and integration into game engines to make it well, work well. And kind of the culmination of it, what, what we'd like to be able to do is have a full body kinematic model where you really know where you are so you can look at yourself and all the data is available for your engine. So now I'll talk a bit about stereo rendering. Uh, most of you guys are familiar with it for TVs. It is um, a little bit different for VR, um, but uh, in a way it's simpler. Um, what you've already seen now, there's two images for left and right eye and we have to do a number of adjustments for it uh, to work. So in a current version of a Rift, uh, the resolution prior is 640 by 800 for each eye. And the way you do it in HMD is you actually set up projection with parallel the axis. So uh, you don't, there's no cross axis type effect. You, press, you just two have two cameras at parallel angles and you render the scene and you need to make sure that they're adjusted for your eyes. Which means that you actually do have to do some type of per user configuration. Um, IPD interpupillary distance between your eyes is important because if you set it right for the person, you get a much better experience. It looks more 3D. So we'll have in the future control panels and ways of getting this information to you, but you'd also want to have customers be able to tweak this in game. Second part is uh, lens distortion. Um, so in Rift, we have uh, a number, a pair of aspheric lenses. And what they do is they magnify and they increase the field of view which is a great thing because you see more of the world um, and it improves immersion. You can see uh, items in the periphery. Um, the downside of that is that it does distort the image. So it creates this kind of bend in concussion effect and what you need to do is cancel that out as uh, with a barrel distortion. And it's usually done in the pixel, pixel shader, the post process. It's simply a function of radius from center. We provide the sample code for it. So it should be easy for you guys to get started. Another detail is uh, you do want to actually render the high resolution to maintain quality. And the reason for it is that you are, your distortion is pulling pixels in, there's extra space around which is now not filled. So you actually have to provide a larger input texture. And the way it works actually is that you, for the quality in the middle to be the best it can be, you have to increase it uh, somewhat significantly. So for the both eyes, in our, most of our demos right now, we are rendering it 2170 by 1360 for the seven inch rift uh, instead of 12, which gets mapped to 1280 by 800. Um, you can tweak that uh, so to trade off the field of view and the quality. And the final kind of technical area which all of us will need to work with and can make or break it is really the quality and performance of rendering. Um, this is one part where a lot of the time is going. We got a one, three mil, one or two or three millisecond sensor input. We're working on improving this, the display part uh, so we can get pixels there earlier. But the part of a game which does the simulation, which does the rendering, needs to be as compact and as efficient as possible. Uh, you do need to maintain uh, V-Sync because if you are in a world and you have this line going cr across your view, it's very obvious. And you need to basically run all the time at 60 FPS. Um, to get for immersion. And one thing is FPS is really not it. The most important thing is the latency. How, f as we talked about, so you want to minimize any type of buffering done on GPUs. GPU manufacturers often try to improve frame rate by introducing these types of effects. We need to do everything possible to remove them. So it means flushing your GPU for event query every frame, uh, 
disabling buffer and control panel, talking to GPU developers to make it all better. Luckily, they are very excited and they're helping us, so this will be much better over time. And there's all the horsepower is really is there already to render what we want. Another technical detail you can do is you can actually move your sensor sampling to the render thread. So if you have a situation where you have simulation which is doing physics and it gets input and that data gets processed and get batched up for render thread to, to actually handle in the next frame, that from the time you get input to, to the render thread, you get extra latency. So what you could actually do is sample the sensor in the beginning of that render thread and update your view matrix. And doing something like that can save you in, in our uh, in one of the use cases up to about 20 milliseconds, which is big. Ultimately, you want the whole rendering to be under about 40 milliseconds or 50 for great experience, and really, the lower the better. So that's really the technical summary. Um, I will now hand it off to Nate to talk about the gameplay. <laughs> 